19 year old female and this happened to me in January of this year. Little background story, my sister, 23 years old, and I were living at my best friend's house with her dad a few months before this. We were kicked out of our parents' house and stayed with my best friend till we got on our feet. After a few months of staying with my best friend, we eventually moved out to my first apartment. I was excited to live independently and provide for myself, and also prove to my parents that I am responsible. Our first apartment was located in a bad part of town. The rent was cheaper, and that's the only way we could afford it at that time. After settling in, we left for a cabin that weekend to celebrate my birthday. When we returned, my sister, who owns a 99 Jeep Cherokee, had it moved slightly as if someone had tried to tow it. My sister doesn't take those types of things easily, so she was going to march over to the leasing office and ask if they tried to move her car out of her spot, but they were closed and she left it alone. The following week on Friday, as I was leaving for work early that morning, I noticed that her car was missing. I called her immediately and asked if she'd moved it that night. She started to become frantic and she came outside. She was starting to cry and called the police. I felt bad for leaving her to go to work, but I did get to leave work early that day. Eventually the same day, we found her car at a local Sherry's parking lot. The conditions of her car were about the same, but a few tools were left in the back seat. Our dad bought us clubs to lock our steering wheel. They gave us a little peace of mind. The Friday after that incident, as I was walking to my car, 96 Honda Accord in the morning for work, I heard a car running. As I walked closer, I noticed that it was my car. I don't know why, but the first thing I did was walk straight up to my car and get inside to turn off the engine. I know, very stupid idea. The entire plastic covering near where I insert my key was missing, and a whole bunch of wires were detached. I had tried several times to turn off my engine, but I couldn't. I was panicking even more when I noticed a screwdriver that was not mine in the passenger seat. I called my sister and she came right out. She was so upset and so was I, I had to call into work so I could file a police report. We were waiting an hour for the police to show up and within that time, my sister and I figured out how to turn off the engine with the missing pieces. We gave the police our statement. We asked if there was any way they could patrol this area more. The policeman stated that there's been a lot of car break-ins and thefts around here and they usually patrol and they're trying to have more cameras installed around. My sister and I didn't know what to think. We thought it was creepy that within the two weeks of being here, we've already encountered two cases of our cars being messed with. Our landlord was surprised to hear that this happened twice and she offered us to let us have the garage for one month free. We took the deal and our personal parking spot was moved closer to our apartment. Even with all the safety precautions we took with our cars, I still felt unsafe. Maybe it was because of the area where the garage was located. It was near a roundabout that was surrounded by trees that were barricaded by a little fence. Whenever I had to go back there to get my car, I constantly felt eyes on me. It was also a process of unlocking the garage, unlocking my car doors, taking off the club from my steering wheel, backing up, getting out and closing the garage door before I left anywhere. I felt by doing this every time, I'm taking so much time to do these things that I don't feel safe being alone anymore. My sister agreed. We knew we had to leave these apartments soon. The following week, my sister left on a trip to Santa Barbara with her friend while I stayed home with my little six-pound chihuahua. Not much of a guard dog, but her presence made me feel better. Another Friday came and I invited my best friend over. We got dressed up and ate out at Olive Garden. That night when we came back home, I dropped my friend off at my apartment doorsteps and drove to the little roundabout area to park my car for the night. As I was unlocking and lifting the garage door, I felt an eerie presence. I felt more uncomfortable than I usually do. I hurried and parked my car in the garage, and I basically ran to my apartment and kept looking back. The following morning, my best friend and I had our whole day planned. I was going to start by picking up my sister from the airport because she was returning that day. As we were walking up to the garage, I noticed the lock that I always have on there was gone. I looked at my friend panicked and I lifted the door. I couldn't believe what I saw. I was beyond shocked. My car was gone. I didn't know what to do at this point. I called my brother and told him everything and he called my dad. I noticed inside the garage there was a huge hole 
as big as the average sized person on the wall between my garage and the garage next to me. That garage belonged to my maintenance man. I called him too and he came right away. I didn't bother to tell my sister as she was on her way back and I didn't want to stress her out. I walked back to my apartment, called the police and waited. I couldn't believe what was happening. I was livid. To think that these people went through so much work just to take my car. They broke through the garage lock, door lock and my club. Also they attempted to steal the truck beside me. My brother and dad were there with me to talk to the officer. My car was found several days later abandoned in a senior community living area. My battery was stolen, stereo was gone, my clothes in my trunk were missing, and my registration. These people not only took car parts, but now they had my information. I didn't want to live there anymore. My sister and I broke the lease. We had to reach out to corporate to get our deposit back because we hadn't even lived there a full month, and we didn't think it was fair for them to keep our deposit. My only worry was, why did they want our cars so bad? Why did they go through so much effort to get them? How did no one see or hear them when they were stealing my car? Why do they want my information? And also, they must have really been watching my every move. They knew the times I worked, my sister's schedule, both our cars. They knew we were young, vulnerable females living alone. The creepiest thing to me is that while I was back there alone with nothing to protect me, they were watching and waiting. I'm lucky I wasn't physically hurt, and to all of you out there thinking you're safe at all times, please be careful no matter what because you never know who's really watching. I'm going to use our real names just because I don't feel like remembering artificial names while trying to remember a story I tried so hard to forget so I'll give it to you raw and unedited. My name is Jimmy. I'm a 24-year-old from Wisconsin. My girlfriend's name is Cassandra, and she too is a 24-year-old female from Wisconsin. At the time, we were both 23, so this happened in late August of 2017. At that time, I had a 2009 Mitsubishi Eclipse GT. This may be a factor in the good outcome from that night later on. So after a rough summer in my hometown and endless problems it seemed... I had enough. I was ready to pack up and go in an instant and that's pretty much what I did. My girlfriend's father owns a 15 acre ranch out in Arizona in the middle of the Sonoran Desert about 45 minutes southwest of Tucson, Arizona. The ranch is in Three Points, Arizona, pretty much 45 minutes north of the Mexican border. My girlfriend's father Rick and I are very much alike. We both enjoy extreme sports, fast cars, and gorgeous women, so a workday for us would fly by with a breeze, like we were two buds kicking it on a weekend. So the idea of living there with him in full seclusion surrounded by desert and my favorite terrain of all time, mountains, seemed like heaven compared to this terrible place I call home. I kicked the idea to my girlfriend the same day I said, screw this, and she agreed it was time for a change of scenery. I packed all of our valuable stuff, stuffed it all in my tiny Mitsubishi and hit the road at 3am the next night. Mind you, I didn't even get paid for my job yet, but I said I'm done with it, I can't be here any longer. I hit the road with about 300 bucks, my girlfriend and a car packed to the brim, and the faith I'll make it safely without trouble. Lucky being a car guy that's ran into problems before, prepared I would say, appropriately and brought some tire pluggers just in case. Little did I know I would need them later on. The trip is going smoothly and we're about 17 hours in. I've already filled up three times and that 300 turned to 200 on top of food stops as well. 13 more hours to go. I can't necessarily say what happened but I was halfway through Texas running low on money. After such a long ride driving straight through, music seemed like it was just messing with my head opposed to keeping me aware and awake so I turned it off. Fifteen minutes later, my tire makes a weird hiss and my steering wheel starts resisting a bit. Luckily, there was an exit coming up in 500 feet. I get off, observe my tire, and, lord behold, an industrial nail plug right in the tire near the edge. I got it out, plug the tire, and put air in it. Temporary success. I continue my journey, letting my girlfriend drive to try to close my eyes for a couple of hours. 
Mind you, we've been driving about 21 hours at this point, and I'm exhausted. I fill up again and continue. I close my eyes and wake up an hour and a half later to still be in Texas. I'm thinking, is this trip ever going to end? Getting kind of frustrated, feeling like my girl probably wasted 60 extra miles driving like a granny, I asked her to pull over and let me finish. I fill the tire up and top off the gas and go. About two more hours pass and New Mexico border is up in the next 30 miles. After being surrounded in total darkness for hours, we make it to a giant gas station, that's literally the name of it, and we pull in. I have half a tank of gas, 15 bucks, and I'm tired. We had eight more hours ahead of us and we really felt we weren't going to make it, so we decided to call her father. No answer. Another call. No answer. Three more calls and still no answer. So we text him and continue on our way. Before we departed the gas station on the border, we checked out our maps to get a good idea of how much longer we had to finish this trip. So there were two routes. A long route that takes about an extra hour cutting through smaller New Mexico cities including Albuquerque with just a small patch of desert to drive through. I noticed the detoured route was an hour shorter in time and a straight shot through the desert. My Apple Maps wouldn't load the route properly or let me use it for directions so I restarted my phone. Still nothing. I had to download Google Maps just so I could use this route. Mind you, the way we chose to take, there were no city lights, no high pollution, just small stop and supply towns with a hundred cars around but not a soul to be found. The first hour was okay besides it being pitch black, traveling on a two lane desert highway with only twenty feet on the road in front of you being visible, nothing else. Not even my tail lights could make anything out behind me. As I'm driving, headlights appear in the distance and I'm thinking to myself, finally, another driver, I won't be on this road alone anymore. After five minutes, the truck finally catches up and is behind me about two car lengths. Remember, I'm driving a small Mitsubishi Eclipse full of a bunch of my belongings, and with my tire having issues, it was putting a bunch of weight on it, making it uncomfortable to drive going at high speeds. So I'm going about 60 miles per hour and I can tell this truck wanted off this road as much as I did because they started passing on the other side of the road going about 90 flying past me. I'm big on cars and I'm our shops driver for our race team in South Arizona so I know cars and when it comes to speed I'm usually spot on with it. I'm thinking in my head, man, I'm jealous. I just want to ditch all this stuff in my car and floor it with this guy. 20 minutes later I'm proceeding on my route and I see a huge semi coming up behind me. They never fully catch up, just close in the distance, I would say 500 to 600 feet. I looked in my rear view and there's still nothing significant. I glue my eyes back to the road for another 3 minutes and check out my rear view again. Wait, he's gone. How, what, how I didn't see any roads to turn down, it's just been desert and one road, I say out loud to myself. Mind you, since we left the gas station on the border, my girlfriend has been sleeping like a newborn. I look over at her to tell her what I just saw, or didn't see, I think. Nah, I'm gonna let her sleep, I'll tell her later. As soon as I'm making my eyes back to the road, my phone internet data completely wiped on me. I couldn't make a phone call, nor send a message. Nothing. Luckily, Google Maps was still loaded, so I continued to follow the same route when, all of a sudden... A bright light came up behind me in a distance probably a mile away. Ground level, this light was so bright but seemed so directed. It didn't illuminate anything around us, it was just pointed at my car, like headlights. I remember saying, oh, you a-hole, out loud flipping my rear view mirror to reflect the lights. I assumed they had their brights on until I looked in my side view and realized how far the light actually was from me. I also said out loud, those are some bright lights, I need those, kind of joking to myself out loud, even though it was one diamond shaped light. I figured it just looks like that because it's far and they're probably missing a headlight so I didn't think much of it, just chopping it up to it's probably the truck driver that disappeared earlier. I drive for 30 more seconds and I look in my side view again, the lights closer and gaining on me extremely fast. Too fast to know nobody was that interested in driving over a hundred miles an hour in pitch black desert with one headlight. I looked down again. 
I look in the mirror. Okay, so I get anxiety and I wake my girlfriend up. I tell her what I've been seeing and ask her to check it out and make sure my eyes aren't messing with me from being so exhausted. She saw it too and I don't know what it was when she looked at it but after all I just told her she looked and the only thing she said when she turned back around from looking was drive faster. I floored it with all my weight on the car and my low pressure tire I gunned it and got to about a hundred when I realized how unsafe the situation was then I receded to about 75 miles per hour just trying to keep my distance from this light then it's gone. We have about 29 miles left till we get on another desert highway going the direction we are headed, and despite all my potential problems, that strange light is all I could think about. About 11 miles to go, the light comes back, and out loud I look at my girlfriend and smile and say, Look, our friend's back, in a joking way with a smirk on my face. At this time though, it made me feel weird. I didn't really think too much of it, just how weird it was. This time the light was closer and I sped up again. It follows us for about six more miles, then goes again. We finally switch routes and stop in this old rundown town about 30 miles west of Roswell, New Mexico. I see the sign stating this and in my head I say, You gotta be kidding me. As my girlfriend and I are big on the paranormal and take a huge interest in it, being a believer for the most part. I joked to my girlfriend about it and stated, I knew it was an alien and we both laughed. This town was so creepy. No gas stations, no lights, just cars on top of cars and no people. There was this old rundown motel that looked to be abandoned, but the only light on or around came from that light over the door of the motel. Also, let me state I found out leaving this town that we were on this historic Route 666, now known as Route Something Old, but you'd never know if you didn't care to look into it. Mind you, my phone is still out of service. I park and get out to try for my phone, after ringing the bell and knocking for about five minutes. I get back into the car and tell my girlfriend, no luck and we're just going to have to continue on. Another 68 more miles to go till we make another turn. God, this is raising the roof on my anxiety and I don't know how I feel at this point. I remember saying, I just want this to be over. Low enough for my girlfriend not to make out what I said, but hear me mumble something. I said no nothing and just continued driving. When we pulled out of the motel we drove past a parked semi off the road right next to the motel. As soon as we took off this truck started right up and got right behind us. I'd say that's weird. Why did he decide to leave when we left? And my girlfriend responds I don't want to find out just drive faster. So he's following us for about 15 miles and we come up to a four-way cross intersection. I stop and I'm like, alright, what's he gonna do? I pull over to the side of the road and he goes past about his business. Instant relief, I felt, I'm not gonna lie. That was short-lived though because immediately getting back on the road, I noticed the light once again came back and we're on a different highway stretch. How? Why? As I'm telling my girlfriend it's back once again. I kid you not, this thing started elevating from ground level just over our car where we could still see it trailing us in the mirror but this time it was trailing us from an aerial position. I freaked, I released my express fear and floored it. It was that feeling when you knew something about to happen any second but you're still trying to get ahead while you can. For those who play PUBG or Fortnite, you know when you're outside the battle circle and storm circle is closing in on you and you're trying to make it before the storm catches you, knowing it's coming faster than you can run and you're expecting it any second to hit you but you don't stop for anything. Yeah, that's exactly how I felt and I just knew something was about to happen to us that night. I was creeping up on a quarter tank of gas with a bum tire I just got 10 extra hours of constant driving on. I was mad, upset, scared and determined all simultaneously and I'm going to be completely honest, I sat here for 30 minutes trying to remember what happened after that, but I honestly can't. I really, really can't, and it's giving me a really sick and nauseous feeling. I remember the whole trip up to a T until that happened, and I remember being sad, highly irritable, and incredibly anxious for the next week. From that night, I just remember making it to a small gas station after that 69-mile stretch I just did. I talked to a local weird looking guy, definitely somebody I'm not used to seeing. 
rough, gritty-looking guy, brownish red head and wore some extremely thick opticals. I told him about our trip and what we saw in the desert and that I don't really remember what happened after I saw it. He chuckled and said, You made it out, guys. They didn't keep you for long. I looked at my girlfriend and we made awkward, nervous chuckles. You can tell we just did it not to be rude by laughing at what seemed like a dark humor joke. I asked, how much more desert do we have to drive through? He says about 45 minutes before we run into our first big city south of Albuquerque. I'm like, dang, but that's 45 minutes seemed a lot better than another two hours, so I threw in my 15 bucks and got back on the road. All this point, I knew we weren't going to make it back to Arizona with the amount of gas we had. With a blink of an eye after we left the desert gas station in the middle of nowhere, my phone service cut back on to my relief and, surprised, I instantly grabbed it and told my girlfriend, Call your dad. She told me she had just lost her phone before we departed from Wisconsin, so we only had my phone. Her dad picked up and decided to meet us in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and we're heavy recreational smokers on top of work and sports and that's what we do to relax. All our family knows it so her dad had some medical grade stuff waiting for us when he met us in Las Croces. Telling him about our experience he laughed about it and said, You sure you guys didn't smoke before that happened? We both laughed and said no and he didn't really take the whole situation too serious. After rolling a nice one up and taking a few deep, satisfying hits, we were back on the road again and a few hours from our destination when I started to really think, what just happened? How did we lose a whole hour and a half of time? As much as I believe in the paranormal, I am still not convinced in the whole alien abduction thing, but that crossed my mind and for the next week, I got all these unusual random emotions and my girlfriend and I had weird marks on our chest, wrist, ankles, and neck. Both of us. It was definitely nerve-wracking and smoking a little bit helped me uncover little details following that, but nothing added up. I don't know what happened that night and I know some of the guys might think that wasn't scary or I want to know what happened. Well, if this was made up writing, I would have made it much more intense and crazy, but this is very true and I want answers as much as some others might. If you guys, and I mean anybody, has traveled in that area or that stretch of freeway in the middle of the night and have experienced anything similar, please, I want to hear it. I can't be the only one with this experience. I should have just listened to my phone and definitely my instincts and took the original route. Though we're good now, for some reason that experience still produces fresh fear and anxiety, and it's driving me nuts. I told the story about my haunted childhood home and now I would like to share something that recently happened to me. A few months ago my wife and I moved back to our home state from Texas and had to stay with my mom until our finances got back in order. Long story short, my wife and I had to expend all of our savings fleeing for our lives. I'll tell that story later because it was definitely a life changer. But when we moved in with my mother the place was absolutely disgusting. My lazy older brother lived there before us and brought bed bugs into the room we stayed in, forcing us to sleep in the living room until we finally moved out a couple of months later. During that time, we would have to be up every day at 6, drive an hour to the next city and get home that night around 1900. It was exhausting for both of us and it got to the point where my symptoms from my TBI would flare up, leaving my wife to help me get up in the morning. One morning in particular, I woke up five minutes earlier than my alarm and decided to close my eyes hoping to catch some more rest. I heard my wife in the bathroom getting dressed, followed by the door opening and her walking past me and into the kitchen. I specifically remember I had my eyes squinted open in time to see her small silhouette walk past me. She was pulling her hair back into a ponytail. I stayed awake after that because she was making so much noise that I groaned at the fact that I was now getting up two minutes earlier than desired. When I sat up on the couch I realized that she had kept the kitchen still dark and the only lighting in the room was provided by the bathroom door left slightly ajar. The noise in the kitchen stopped too, so I called out for her. 
When she didn't respond the second time, I went to the kitchen and no one was in there. I then went to the bathroom and saw her putting on her makeup. I asked her if she was just in the kitchen and she said no. I thought it was weird because I saw someone walk into the kitchen. I even heard pots and pans clinging together. I went back to the kitchen and just stared at it. Everything felt false, like someone was hiding and preparing to jump out. I ended up ignoring it and going about my day. Months after moving out, we met up with my godparents and my godfather informed me that a woman OD'd at the condo and my mother just never told us about it. She died on the couch my wife and I slept on. I'm pretty sure I saw her that morning getting up with us to start her day, too. I'm a 12-year-old girl, and at this time I was around 7, so a few years back, and this was in broad daylight as well. I used to go back and forth to my mom and dad's house. I hated going to my mom's because she would neglect me and because it was in the middle of the city of Tent City, aka Seattle, and my dad would usually park his jeep near the apartment complex, but it would usually be across the street. So it was a pretty normal day. We started waiting after my dad parked the car and I tried not to cry. And let me clear this up, my dad is a big dude, meaning he's pretty buff. He has a shaved head and pale skin with freckles and bright blue eyes. My friends and other people think he's intimidating because he doesn't really smile in public and when he looks at something far away, he glares. But anyways, some homeless people walked by and some regular citizens, just like normal. I'd look out my window in the back, then peeking out of the front passenger's window staring. I felt like something was about to pop up out of nowhere. I just had that sinking feeling in my stomach. Then my eyes widened as I see a man with frizzy black hair, bloodshot eyes, and with a long t-shirt and long baggy shorts walking up to my dad's cars, eyeing me down as I sat in my car seat getting scared. He jogged over to the passenger window and started banging on it like he was going to die. The window was cracked open. He started to pry it open, still looking at me but always glancing at my dad. So my dad had this pepper spray at all times anywhere, especially in Seattle. So as this guy is asking for money and food banging on the window, my dad was spraying pepper spray at him while I was crying insanely crazy in the back because I thought my dad was going to get hurt. He backed off and screamed obscenities over and over again. Once the guy opened his eyes, his eyes were even more bloodshot. He looked insane, like he wasn't before. He ran off bumbling into every person in front of him. Thankfully, my dad didn't get hurt and I didn't either. The scary part is right before he ran off, he mumbled, I'll be waiting for you. I didn't know what that meant and I was so confused. But then later that night, I was with my mom playing with her boyfriend's cat. My mom and I hear a knock on the door. She gets up and walks over to the door looking through the peephole. After she looked, she locked the door quickly and she had a worried face. I would ask, who's there? And she'd reply saying, it's that homeless guy. My dad told my mom what happened and that's how she knew. I was horrified. Now I knew what he meant when he said, I'll be waiting for you. I had a sudden sinking feeling again. The rest of the night was fine. No more disturbances, but... My mom's cat in the middle of the night started meowing loudly at the door sitting next to it, and her cat never does that. We've been on edge, and I truly hope that that homeless man never returns or waits for us again. I believe I was about 16 when this took place, so I'm guessing it was in the spring to summer of 2001. It was either a Friday or Saturday night when I got a text asking what I was up to and if I wanted to go hang out. I have no idea who the text was from as the number wasn't saved in my phone and didn't have a name at the end of the text. I text back and got a call. Picking it up, I hear my friend Ong's voice. I was happy to hear from her as we went to secondary school together. I went on to college and she decided to do other things so we didn't see each other regularly anymore. She didn't have social media and refused to have a mobile phone. I praised her for finally getting with it and getting a phone. She burst my bubble when she said it was a friend's, we had a quick chat. 
It was probably about 10 p.m. and I can't be arsed to get ready so I declined and said another time. Around 12 a.m. I got a text. I thought she was contacting me again. The text read something along the lines of, Hey, this is Daniel, Ong's friend. I'm bored and stuck here until Ong wants to leave. Hope you don't mind me texting you. I didn't at this age. I used to be up till stupid o'clock on the internet and as he was a friend of my friend I didn't see a problem. So we text for a bit. It was kind of nothing this conversation. Around 2 a.m. or so I get a call. It's him. He said I sounded nice and that he wanted to have a chat. Okay, cool. I'm still wide awake, so we had a chat. It was alright. We had a laugh. Talked about nothing much for a while and then said goodbye. Next morning I get a text from him. I reply. He texts me all day and rings me again later. I found out more about him, that he works in the local shopping center in a certain store I went to all the time. The kind of stuff he likes, which is nothing like me, but whatever. We talk about where we live, as we live in different towns about 20 minutes apart by bus. At this point, he knows what I look like, as Ung has shown him photos of us she had, but he also had seen my Friendster page, which had current pics of me. He, like Ung, didn't have a social media back then, so I didn't know what he looked like, but he described himself. Could have been literally any boy in southeast London at that time. I didn't really care what he looked like as I wasn't interested like that, but I had no problem chatting. So this carries on for a week or two. Him texting me, calling me, find out about me, asking loads of questions, which at the time seemed harmless. Around this time, I had time off college for Easter holidays, and he starts saying we should meet up as we are both free. I tell him I can't as I have to do some coursework. This was only half true. I did have coursework, but I always leave it till the last minute, so was literally just being lazy sitting around the house. He clearly didn't get the message as he started to text me constantly. If I didn't reply fast enough for him, he sent more texts and would call. I was like, dude, I'm so busy trying to do this. When I have time, I will text you. After a few days of that, I got a text saying, I have to go do XYZ. I'm in your area. Let's meet. I told him I was busy and couldn't. He said that was okay, but then kept bombarding me with texts, urging me to meet him. No. Two days later, I get a text saying he is in my area again and we have to meet. I say no. At the end of that week, he is there again and again. No. The start of the week, he starts again about being in my area. I ignore the text this time. Later on that day, I get a call from a local area number. I pick up and it's him. He says he is here and wants to hang out and that I didn't reply to his text. I tell him that I'm not home and I've been flat out and that I will text him when I'm free. I found out the number he called from was a public telephone box on the main road that connects to the road I live on. The constant texts were annoying but I let them slide as I had no intention on meeting him and it was only a text. But to find out that he was actually literally in my area and knew roundabout where I lived, all the questions he was asking before that seemed harmless made sense now. He was narrowing down where I lived to the street, as I have a college at the bottom of my road and a park at the top, he knew this. He knew what bus I got from college and to the stop I got off at, which further narrows down the part of the street I lived on. He used to ask things about the clothes I wore and accessories I had, what patches, etc. were in my backpack, so he would definitely know it was me if he saw me. No, this was not cool at all. I told him that I am not meeting him anytime soon that I am busy and that he needs to chill out as I don't need the hassle. This really put me off wanting to speak to him, as it was so weird and I really should have told him to buzz off at this point, but when you really don't care about the person other than to have a chat with, I just thought if I lessen the contact, he will get bored and buzz off on his own accord. School started again and I felt safer, knowing that he couldn't just be in my area. He had college quite far from me so I wouldn't run into him. But the shop I usually went to, which was near my college, I avoided as there was nothing in there I couldn't get elsewhere and didn't really go into the shopping center unless I had to and that would be during school lunchtime, so thankfully he wouldn't be there. This wasn't because I was scared, I just didn't want to meet him and I was starting to get angry the more I thought about it and didn't want to be nasty to him. So the text continued over the next few weeks. I wouldn't reply to the majority of them and when I did they were polite and stated that I had exams soon. I didn't want the distraction. I then started to ignore his messages. They didn't stop. 
Another phone number I didn't know texted me. I was like, who is this? And of course it was him from his mom's phone. And he was angry that I'd replied to that text and not his. Now this was becoming a joke. During this time, one Saturday night, my mom rang me as I was coming home from a gig. She told me a boy I went to primary school called Morley rang to speak to me today and asked if he could call again, and before the call ended, asked if I had a boyfriend. I was like, what? Morley used to like me back in primary, but we hadn't spoken since we left school at like 11, but our moms still chatted occasionally, so I had no clue what this was all about. I get a call from Morley the next day. He tells me he is sorry for ringing me, but he really needs to ask me a question. So he asked me if I had a boyfriend. I said I didn't. He then asked if I knew someone named Daniel. I said yes, that I had been speaking to someone called Daniel, but what started out as a pleasant chat and some texts had turned into way too much. He then went on to tell me that Daniel goes to his sixth form and is loosely associated with a friend group as no one really likes him. Boys being boys, they were talking about girls and Daniel went on to talk about his girlfriend. They asked questions about her and he told them who she was, what she looked like, what she was into, where she lived. He didn't think much of it. When he came back to school after the holidays, he had a bunch of clothes in his bag. They asked him where he was going, as they wear uniform and he was bragging about how he had come straight from hers as he stayed around her house lots during the holiday and told them in detail how he would be intimate with her and got to all sorts. He used to entertain them with stories about her all day and after a while finally showed them her picture. My picture. Morley was livid on the phone. He said the stuff Daniel was saying that we had done was just plain nasty and the stuff he was saying about me he didn't think was true and wanted to confirm. He told me he would ring me back in a few days. Daniel was still trying to speak to me. After hearing from Morley what he had been up to, I'm not going to answer clearly, I set the number to divert. I don't know if you could block numbers on my phone back then. If it could, I didn't know how. I ignored the text he sent me. I didn't even open them. I got home from school Monday afternoon and at about 6 o'clock I get a call from Morley, who again was angry but was delighted. He told me he just got home and that Daniel had come into school with clothes in his bag again that morning and said that he had been staying at mine and that we were doing all sorts of things at that point. And Morley in front of everyone was like, you have never been to her house. He was like, of course I have. And Morley was like, well, it must have been a Wendy house as he knows for certain that he has never been to my house as he knows me and had spoken to me yesterday and that I am not his girlfriend. In fact, he has never met me, only spoken to me and how I refused to meet him and have been pretty much ignoring him as he kept turning up where I lived to try and spot me. This didn't go down well, obviously, as he had been made to look like a complete idiot. That night, my phone wouldn't stop with texts and calls from his mom's number. He wouldn't stop calling. I told my mom everything after Jay called as she wanted to know what it was about. I gave the phone to my mom at 11 p.m. and she picked up and he was sounding all in a panic saying he needed to talk to me. She said no, I was in bed, how inappropriate it was to call at this time and not only that but to not call again. Number put on divert and I was still getting voicemails. I texted him and told him to leave me alone that it really is enough now. I know what he did and that I don't want to know him. He went quiet till around 2am when he started calling again from a third number. I was asleep and my mom was awake. The call woke me up so I called her in and she picked up the phone and went mental at him. She said she knows all about it and to leave me alone or there will be trouble. He still texted after that my mom was beyond livid and at 6am she rings his mom's mobile, woke her up, told her all about what her son was up to. She was initially angry to be woken up so early but when my mom laid it out she just went quiet and was like, I'm sorry. I will deal with it. I didn't hear from him again after that. Ung called me. I didn't speak to her since that first night about probably just over a month and a bit before and said she found out what had happened. I think from his mum as she wanted to know the validity of the call she received and was incredibly sorry. That he wasn't even really her friend. They knew each other from primary school and he lived close and that he just turned up at her house and imposed himself on her 
and her mum would always let him in despite her warning her not to, as she liked him, so she just put up with him. She did say that in the past, when he was in secondary school, he became obsessed with a girl in their area and used to effectively stalk her and that her mum complained to his, but that he was young then and didn't think he did stuff like that anymore. Clearly, he never stopped. My husband spent the better part of 04 to 06 in Iraq and was going to further his service, until we got a tip from his former squad leader at Fort Knox. Dude, don't. He doesn't talk about it much and I don't ask him to. His service dog is named Brother, is a full-blooded greyhound and is around 8 months old. Still a puppy really. The moment we picked him up, he had spent 24 hours a day with my husband. It wasn't until recently that we had to let him sleep in a different room, too hot for puppers as of late. AC is this dog's fourth best friend, food is second, and I'm thirdish. Brother has slept on the couch for about a week. Back to story time. The house we currently live in was only owned by one other family. The owner of the house was named John. I know a lot about John just from googling him, his military records right down to his birthplace. His wife passed recently. I met John in the garage about a month into living there. I was laying in our tiny grasshopper-style camper and looking out the open window. I saw the gray tuft of hair peek over the side, followed by a wrinkly forehead, a pair of gleaming blue eyes and crow's feet on both sides of his face. He was not see-through. I thought someone was in our garage. People have been known to be curious about the setup in our camper. He wasn't threatening. In fact, I'd be happy to talk with him. Once I scooted out the door, he was gone. That's when I did my research, just as I did on my childhood home. John doesn't bother me or my husband. It's more like an acceptance. He doesn't come in our room, just stays in the living room and kitchen and the office room that he plays chess in. I know the noise a glass chess set makes. I'm a nerd. Brother has been more nervous in the house recently. He gets excited to leave when he used to be content being a couch potato. Two days ago, I had a doctor's appointment. My husband wasn't confident with walking him in a heavy traffic area yet, so brother got his Kong. Once he gets the Kong, he's more like, bye, see you whenever. Once we get home, he was excited to go to the backyard, did his usual laps, then he stood at the door trembling. Yesterday, he looked through every room. We took three trips and he did it every single time. This hasn't been a problem before. Am I going to have to ask John not to harass our dog, or flat out tell him to leave? I'm not sure how receptive you all will be to considering this a scary story. This is not a tale of horror or tension. Instead, it's a very short yet dreadful recount of something that happened when I was just a little boy. It's a flash of memory, with no discernible beginning or end. Instead, the real terror is the implications, and how it shifted my perception of what is considered safe in the world, and how it should shift yours. I'm not sure of the exact age in which this memory takes place, but I was young, probably not even a preteen. I grew up in Washington Heights in New York City, essentially the upper west side of Manhattan. I was a 90s kid, born in the mid-80s. No, I'm not sure about how it is now because I live in a different state, but back then the neighborhood was not so great. Drugs and gangs were normal and seeing red and blue bandanas hanging out the back of baggy jeans was just another thing. As a result, I was sheltered. Not allowed to go out much because, honestly, there wasn't anything worth going out to. So while I was used to seeing and hearing certain things, I was thankfully shielded by my mom from ever actually experiencing any of it. This memory is one of those times I heard something. Like I said, there is no build up to the moment, I just remember it, just a flash in time. The moment is me lying in bed in the middle of the night, sheet pulled up to my chin. I was on my side facing the window. It was a large window because it was where the fire escape was and at the moment the blinds were up, letting in the orangey glow of the street lights outside. I'm not sure why the blinds were up or how much they were drawn but I do remember that glow. I was wide-eyed and listening, listening to a man I could not see somewhere out in the street. 
We lived on the fourth floor, so my view was just of the apartment building across the way. The man had a Hispanic accent, not surprising since Washington Heights was predominantly Dominican. He sounded older, maybe middle-aged, approaching elderly, but it was hard to tell. It was hard to tell because he was wailing and moaning. The only word he could occasionally call out was help between his exasperated groans. He sounded in so much pain. I just listened and waited for their voices or for any kind of commotion or response, but there wasn't any. I remember it went on for quite a while. Now, at some point there was a response, of course, but I just don't remember. My memory ends and stops there. I knew there had to be some kind of response because the story of what happened came out. Apparently, a cab driver got into an argument with his patron when dropping him off. They both stepped out of the vehicle and the patron stabbed the cab driver before fleeing. The cab driver then just lay there, calling for help. He lay there and I listened to his voice echoing, empty off the surrounding brick buildings. I was transfixed by the noise. At the time, I didn't know why I was fascinated by it, but as I got older I realized why. You see, I lived on the cross street that connected two main streets, Amsterdam and Broadway. The street was one way, so it was small and narrow, and along both sides ran four-story apartment buildings crammed tight next to one another, all inhabited, and it's New York City. It really does never sleep. Granted, my area didn't buzz like Times Square in the middle of the night, but people were up. My point is, there was no reason that man should have been calling out for more than 30 seconds before someone responded. Just within his 500 foot radius had to be dozens of people, all inside their apartments. That was what was so fascinating, the silence that accompanied his calls. Fast forward to me sitting in psychology class my freshman year of college and I am reading a textbook in class about the bystander effect. The concept was appalling to me as I read. If you don't know what the bystander effect is, it is essentially a phenomenon that will shatter your entire sense of safety in public places. It is an event where individuals are less likely to help a victim when others are around. A classic image, and one I saw in the textbook, is of a man sprawled out on the sidewalk of a busy street in midday with people walking around him. The book gave an example of a woman who was dragged through the streets of a suburb in broad daylight by an assailant. She was kicking and screaming and the man assaulted her. I believe she was even killed. And no one called the police. No one came outside. Everyone closed their blinds because they were afraid of and thought, well, someone must have called 911. This concept haunted me for days because I, will again reiterate, lived in New York City where sprawled out homeless people or druggies or drunks or whoever were everywhere. How many times have I walked by an unmoving body in the train station? How many times have I seen someone being harassed in a crowded train car and everyone just looked away? Looking back now, I think the concept hit me so hard because I subconsciously linked it to that memory of the wailing woman. From then on, till this very day, I always stay aware of my surroundings with that phenomenon in mind. Now, you might still be wondering where the horror is. Well... I want you to imagine that you are being followed by a very creepy person. So you duck into a busy coffee shop and feel at ease. I mean, how many of these subreddit stories talk of situations like that? Now imagine that person just comes over and pulls out a knife. What do you think is going to happen? Do you honestly think someone is going to risk their own life to wrestle down that man for his knife just to save you? No, think about what happens after he stabs you. Believe it or not... He is most likely going to just walk out that shop with people cowering away from him. Now you are bleeding and people are finally starting to help. Fifteen minutes go by and you realize no one has called the ambulance because everyone assumes someone else did it. Like I mentioned, I've ridden public transportation and seen examples of this a few times. People look the other way because they are afraid. I stepped in a couple of times but I remember I was terrified each time. And I definitely let some stuff go because you honestly have to judge and assess the situation and be realistic. This is the reality, that the reassurance you feel being in a public place is an illusion. Look at it logically. By feeling safe in public, you are essentially placing your trust in complete strangers. You are literally relying on their heroism. And that is ridiculous. Would you jump in and save and help a man being pushed around by a huge muscular guy over six feet tall? 
or if he had a weapon. Doubtful. But this is what you choose to believe for yourself. Look around the next time you are outside. Those are the people you are entrusting your life with when danger hits at that moment. And remember, the more people around, the less likely you will be helped. That's the dread that this early childhood memory instilled upon me, knowing that most of us are wired for self-preservation, knowing that if you are laying out in the street, bleeding out and wailing weakly for help, nearby bystanders will just close their blinds and raise the volumes of their television, and they will feel no guilt because, after all, someone will end up helping, right? As a child, I have always been able to experience the world around me differently than others could. For example, when I was a toddler, during bath time my mother would leave the door open and let me bathe alone. That's when this small couple would check on me by peering their heads around the corner and asking if I was okay. They would never fail to make me smile because I felt how much they loved and cared for me. I always said yes and then they would tell me goodbye and disappear until my next bath. It wasn't until I was around five or six when it dawned on me that they weren't human and none of this was normal. So, at the next bath when they peered again, I was terrified. I think they picked up on it because they never returned after that. Now when I say this couple was small, I mean they had the proportions of a modern human but were the physical size of a bar stool. And even though their faces were blurred, I could tell that they were genuinely happy when they saw me. Perhaps they were my spiritual guardians and I was lucky enough to see them. After they left, I was plagued with horrible night terrors that were always riddled with endless death, blood, and demonic entities. It was for this very reason that I grew up absolutely mortified of horror films until I was in high school. Every once in a while, I would also be taunted by something that would whisper my name at night and watch me sleep in my bedroom. These events resulted in me sleeping in my mother's room until I was in middle school. When I turned seven, my mother moved my brother and I to a house in the suburbs, and that's when evil things, for lack of a better phrase, picked up. I can't share everything that happened because I can't remember it all, but I will recount my most horrifying events. My mother and brother never believed me when I said that there was something wrong with our house, but my favorite cousin did. Every time she would come over for a sleepover, she'd stay by my side. I specifically remember when she was getting ready to take a bath and told me to go with her because something is wrong with your house and I don't want to be alone. It was reassuring that I wasn't the only one who felt this but it sent shivers down my spine because I had to live there. Since I was the youngest and my mother worked late, whenever I got home from school I would be alone until about 8 o'clock. My brother would often go to a friend's house then return after school so I would typically finish up my chores before watching TV. Instead of a basement, we had a lower den area that was adjacent to the kitchen. I would often wash dishes while watching the TV in the den. This one night, I was watching Spongebob and I remember specifically it was the hash slinging slasher episode and for some reason I felt freaked out. After it ended, Nick at Night came on and I felt like watching the brandy version of Cinderella. If you haven't seen it, it's fantastic. I went into the den and switched the TV over to VCR mode and right at that moment I was hit with a wave of overwhelming dread. I somehow knew that the moment I pressed play all of the lights would go out. I tried to shake it off as me just being a squishy softy and pressed play. All of the lights in the den flicked out. It sounded like the breaker was hit to intentionally cut them off. My body reacted and I tripped upstairs, grabbed my cat, and yanked my dog into my mother's bedroom. Our dog, Coco, wasn't allowed in her room and cowered by the door, but I didn't care. We sat in there until my mom came home. There were multiple instances throughout the years where I would hear voices, footsteps, doors creaking open, but nothing will ever compare to what I saw before we moved out. I was 13 at the time in my mother's room and trying to fall asleep. My mother had this ceiling fan above her bed and for some reason it captivated my attention. I don't know how long I stared at it until something dripped from the center. It looked like wet black tar as it began taking shape above me. I was frozen. 
absolutely mortified. The dark mass finally opened its eyes. I will never forget they were a piercing yellow and mimicked the shape of a snake's. It dripped down close to my face, almost a foot away, and smiled. Jagged white teeth revealed themselves to me under the glow of the pale moonlight that crept in between the drapes by the bed. I was so frightened that I couldn't move and all I could do was watch this demon move closer to me. I'm not sure if I was trying to decide whether or not it was a dream, but I didn't want it to be reality and unfortunately, it was. It was inches away from my face when my body finally reacted. I shut my eyes and cried out for my mom. She is a very heavy sleeper so all she did was mumble what was wrong. I sobbed and incoherently whimpered that there was something in the ceiling fan. I just remember her being annoyed and saying something before leaning up and cutting on the fan. My eyes bulged as I watched the demonic mass fling onto the floor. I must have stayed up for hours waiting for it to crawl up the bed and end me, but it never did. I eventually fell asleep and I never saw the creature again. I'm 26 now and I have experienced so much more paranormal stuff since then, like my wife's abusive ex-girlfriend's spirit tormenting us, but I'll share that one and others later. In the late summer of 2017 began a strange phase in my life that led to a sequence of paranormal events that haunt me to this day and will haunt me forever. From about August to October is the timeline for these events. I started watching these videos on YouTube about stupid 3am challenges knowing most of them were fake. However, a few really did intrigue me. One known as the closet game especially and the use of the Ouija board. In my garage, I played the closet game in this small room within the garage. Nothing really worked, but I do recall always getting bad vibes from that room ever since then. I started playing with a Ouija board first with friends, then started playing it alone to see if it would work. I know you are never supposed to play these alone, and I still did it. I played so often, talking to many different entities. Eventually, I started talking to Zozo. I knew Zozo was bad from the get-go. I've seen all about him on YouTube and read up extensively doing my own research on what the name was based from and why they use it. I say they because, like you, I also believe that Zozo is not a real name. I believe that it's a trick name bad spirits use to gain power. I eventually became obsessed with the board and Zozo, speaking to him almost every day and night just casually laughing as he threatened me, knowing that he really couldn't do much. That's what I thought at least. However, I started to notice some changes. One night I decided to play the Ouija board in the room I play the closet game in. After all, it did give me bad vibes so I, being the idiot I am, decided sure. As I played alone in this room by myself, there sat an old TV that was not plugged in. I could see my own reflection somewhat cloudy in the TV but it was easy to make out features of myself. I began to play the board and, as always, Zozo appeared. Whenever I would talk to him, I never had fear, and I knew he was a demon. I believed he knew I knew this, and the fact that I was still talking to him made him somewhat calmer. He was always very calm with me, and when I would ask questions, he would respond respectfully. Me and him would tease each other often. I asked where he was sitting, and the planchette pointed directly in front of me, where the TV was. I asked if he could do something in some way to show himself to me, and he moved swiftly to yes. I quickly asked what he was going to do, and the planchette moved to the center of the board and moved forward. I didn't understand at first, but I realized that he was pointing. I looked up at the TV and watched in horror, disbelief, and awe as my own reflection began to morph into a horrific creature. It somewhat still held some of my features, i.e. my hair and clothes, However, my eyes went pitch black, looking like holes. It was like staring into a deep abyss. The eyes were not just circular. They seemed like they were dripping almost. The darkness slowly dripping down out of the reflection's eyes. The mouth was hilariously enough exactly like the scream mask. It looked horrific, but also cliche, so I'm not sure if this was generally an experience or not, but it was very interesting to say the least. 
On another day, my friend came over and me and him were smoking in my garage. I know again that you are never supposed to play the Ouija board in an altered state of mind, but at this point, I did not know that Zozo had influence over me. I go to play the board asking my friend if he wanted to join. He politely refused and I played alone again talking with Zozo. I got bored of course as I always talked to Zozo and decided to just put the board away. I got out my box of knives and was showing my friend my collection. We started feeling this weird energy in the air, like static. You know when you feel static electricity pulling your hair towards it, it was like that everywhere. I thought that it was just me so... Funnily, I went to touch my friend to shock him, however it didn't work. He was also feeling the static energy and as quick as it went, it seemed to vanish. I started spacing out after this. Apparently, I had grabbed one of my knives and very slowly put it to my neck and started leaning my head on it, as if it was about to slice my own throat. When I came to, I felt the knife pressed against my neck and was confused, my friend not paying attention and on the computer. At that moment, I knew immediately that I could no longer play the Ouija board. Promised myself that I would never play it again and put it away in my closet. I about three times a week would find myself unaware, reaching for the board even though I promised I would never play this. This is when I realized I was under some sort of demonic influence. I have since cleaned myself of this and am okay now, but I still have one more story. One night I was sneaking out of my house and I went to hop the gate that leads into the alley so I could get out of my backyard. Once I hopped the gate I started walking out of the alley when I extremely distinctly heard a loud whisper, come back, in a sinister tone. I screamed like a little girl and ran in my car to get out of there. And the same night once I got home at around 3am, at the time I wasn't aware it was 3, I decided to open my third eye in my bathroom. A lot of people have their own opinions about whether it works or not and I'm fully aware that people have their doubts and that's okay because I didn't believe it at first either but it does work. Anyways, back to the point. I was opening my third eye and right when I felt the energy very furiously tingling my forehead, as it opened I heard a demonic laugh. Three little laughs that sounded like they were from a horrific creature. I ran out of the bathroom and felt a malicious energy behind me. I ran to my room and closed my eyes and prayed so hard to ask God to forgive me because I did something that I shouldn't have and asked him for help. Immediately I felt the horrible energy dissipate. I haven't dabbled in the paranormal much since, but I do still have odd occurrences here and there. Thanks for hearing me out. I was at the clinic with my mom to grab some medicine for what I am currently going through. My mom had went to the other side of the wall behind me to talk to a woman quickly as I waited in line to confirm who I am so they can either get started on making my medication or give it to me. The line wasn't really the line you imagine. Basically yes, everyone was waiting for their turn but it was only me in line waiting for the lady in front of me to finish at the computer with the doctor so I could go. While waiting, a man comes in. He is clearly in his early 60s. I could tell that from the small glance I gave him when he entered. Instead of standing or sitting anywhere in the room that the size of a small living room where you could literally go anywhere, he decides to go right behind me. Now, that would have been okay if it wasn't for the fact that he was so close to me that I could feel his breath. The warmth sent chills down my spine. I could just tell he was looking at me, all of me, not missing so much as an inch. He let out a soft, satisfied stretch of, mmm. I could hear his leather jacket rub against itself. This guy dressed sort of like a creep, too. He had a shirt, sweatshirt, and a brown leather jacket to top it all off. He wore a hat, too. The thing is, it's an extremely nice day out, which made it odd he would wear so much, and he just seemed so concealed and on purpose. I am a 14-year-old female, but I'm short and skinny, so I look 11 or 12. He then continues to get closer to me. You can tell because his breaths begin to get so much more powerful and audible. He then silently moans at me and backs up. I would not necessarily say I was frozen in place. I'd say I was shocked and disgusted, but I was more waiting for the moment he'd touch me so I could turn around and hit him. Almost on cue from when he backed up, 
my mother turned the corner. My mom also looks like a college student aside from being in her mid-thirties, so I'm sure he was a tad bit confused at that, although I could not tell because my mom brought me to a line in a different spot, saying I was in the wrong one. Now, I would have mentioned him to my mom earlier, but I didn't want to interrupt her conversation. By the time my mom finished talking with the doctor and we went to sit down, he was gone. I mean, he was literally gone. The line itself takes up to a minimum of five minutes, and talking with the doctor can be up to seven. My mom finished talking to the lady early, but he was gone, which means upon entering, he decided to prey on me for no reason at all. Me and my mom waiting 30 minutes simply for my medicine to be made and not once did I see him come by. I thought it'd be best to tell my mom in the car about my encounter with the man. She then told me about the encounter she had recently. My mom delivers mail from many different small towns. This town was of her smallest with a population of 20 to 25 people. When she entered the neighborhood, a man she had never seen before riding a children's bike was going around, which was already weird enough. He drove the bike into a driveway where my mother assumed he went inside. She also assumed that he was just visiting family and that is why she was incapable of recognizing him. She had this job for 30 years with the same route. That is how she knows everyone if you were confused on that. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, or let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear it featured here on the channel. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.